So Abraham is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 11, verse 26, though not by the name Abraham, he's called Abram. Genesis eleven twenty six 26 reads, when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. The Lord gives Abram the name Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 5. Now, I'll refer to him by both names this morning, probably more as Abraham than Abram, but we're talking about the same person here. So let's read a little bit because we find the story of Abraham beginning at the end of Genesis 11 through Genesis 25. All right, so let's, let's start in Genesis 12, all right? So I told you we we're going to be in Genesis, so let's, let's pick up in Genesis 12, beginning with the first verse. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So notice the Lord tells Abram to leave his country, leave his homeland, leave his family, his father's house, and go to the land that the Lord is going to show him. And notice at verse 4, Abram did what the Lord told him to do. And when Abram is in the land of Canaan, the Lord promised him to your offspring, I will give this land. So here we see the Lord commands and Abraham obeys. The writer of Hebrews cites Abraham as an illustration of faith. If you recall, we've, we've mentioned the fact that Hebrews 11 gives us these illustrations of faith. What does faith mean? look like well here the writer of hebrews cites abraham as an illustration of faith notice hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 it declares by faith abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going abraham was a man of faith and you see in genesis 12 when god tells Abram to go to a particular place, Abram obeys. And the writer of Hebrews cites Abraham as an example of faith. And in fact, Galatians chapter 3 verse 9 refers to Abraham as the man of faith. Now, if we go back to Genesis chapter 15, we're told explicitly that Abram believed the Lord. So you were in Genesis 12, so I want you to now go to Genesis 15. Again, starting with the first verse, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Abram believed 
what the Lord told him. The Lord takes him outside and has him look at the night sky and he tells him that his descendants or his offspring shall be numerous. Now, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 is referred to in the New Testament. Paul refers to this text in Romans chapter 4 and in Galatians chapter 3. James refers to it in James chapter 2. Now, let's be clear. Abraham was, was counted as righteous not because of his works, not because he had merited it or earned it, but rather because of his faith in the Lord. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 refers to the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So when we think about Abraham, Abraham's faith is seen remarkably in his offering of his son Isaac to the Lord. Now, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. We're not going to talk about that today. But in offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice to the Lord, Abraham's faith is seen very clearly. Now, righteousness, as we talked about last week, is not earned. It's not deserved. Righteousness is a gift. We can say the exact same thing about our salvation. Our salvation is not earned. It is, it is not deserved. It is a gift. The second half of Romans 6.23 declares the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see clearly from Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and right here, Hebrews 11, verse 8, Abraham was a man of faith, but we also understand Abraham was a man of obedience. Abraham's faith resulted in his obedience. Notice here in Hebrews 11, verse 8, it mentions Abraham's faith and his obedience. Faith results in obedience. Faith is revealed through actions in my life, in your life. Now, we talk about our four G's, gather, group, give, and go. And that fourth G refers to our daily lives. We go as everyday followers of Jesus. We are to go in obedience as everyday followers of Jesus. So for us who gather here on Sundays, who are a part of a group in the life of our church, who give of our finances, who give through serving, those of us who are followers of Jesus, walking with Jesus, as we go in our everyday lives in obedience, what we understand is that faith and obedience are necessarily a part of following Jesus daily. To follow Jesus daily, to walk with Jesus daily, necessarily includes faith and obedience. Trust in the Lord, faithfulness to the Lord. Our faith in the Lord will result in our obedience to the Lord. Now, Jesus emphasizes the importance of obedience when he asks the question, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? That's the question that, that Jesus poses. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you. Well, Jesus then goes on to give the following illustration in Luke chapter 6. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So Jesus asks on the one hand, why do you call me 
your Lord? Why do you say, Lord, Lord, and then not do what I tell you to do? And then he gives an illustration. An illustration of a person constructing a house on a solid and secure foundation versus one who builds it on a shaky foundation. And the difference between the two is the one who hears his word and does his word versus the one who hears his word and doesn't do his word. If we believe in Jesus, we should be obeying him. In fact, obedience is an evidence of salvation. Now, just because you do the right things, just because you come to church on Sunday, just because you give financially to support the mission of the church, just because you show up to help out in children's ministry, just because you open your house for a small group, right? Those are not the things that, that get you in. Like, those are not the things that, that, that bring about or cause your salvation. Now, all of those things could be a product of salvation and ought to be a product of salvation. Now, that may not be true of every single one of us, that all of those things, I mean, you don't have to host a small group in your home in order to be saved, right? That's not a necessary product of salvation. But obedience is a necessary product of salvation. If I'm truly saved, if you're truly saved, if I'm truly a child of God, if you're truly a child of God, obedience is a necessary product of God's saving work in our lives. Because the God who justifies us is the God who sanctifies us. The God who calls us to himself, the God who regenerates us, the God who saves us, the God who causes us to be born from above does not leave us as those who are just saved. He continues to do his work in us. The God who saved us, justified us, is the God who continues to save us, sanctifying us. I shared with you last week that when someone comes in for a membership appointment, I'll walk through a method of sharing the gospel that I, I learned. Three circles. But it's not just with those who are wanting to join the church, it's also those who are wanting to be baptized. In fact, this past week I had a baptism appointment with one of the kids in our children's ministry. And as I walk through the three circles, I'm, I'm sharing the gospel, right? It's not, it's not just that we want members of our church to understand the gospel and to be believers, right? We believe in what's called regenerate church membership. I know that sounds fancy, but what we're talking about is the membership of First NSB needs to consist of people who are truly and genuinely saved. The membership of First NSB needs to consist of people who have put their faith and trust in a crucified and risen Savior, have repented of their sin and put their trust in Christ. And so the baptism the, the membership appointment is an opportunity to share the gospel, make sure they understand the gospel. Well, the same thing, before someone is baptized, before we immerse them in water, we want to make sure they understand the gospel. Because immersing someone in a body of water is not what brings them new spiritual life. They get wet, and it is a beautiful symbol, a beautiful picture of what has already happened if, in fact, they are saved. But being immersed in a body of water is not a saving event. Repenting of sin and putting personal trust in Christ is what brings about salvation. And so as I walk through the three circles, we talk about God's design. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. God created the world just the way he wanted it to be. But the problem is, is that every last one of us have departed. We've moved away from God's design. We've, we've rebelled against God's will. And it leads us to a place of spiritual brokenness. And no matter how hard we may try, we can't fix the fact that we're spiritually broken. But the good news is God loves us. He gave His Son Jesus for us. Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect life, never did one thing wrong. He died on a cross for my sin, for your sin. 
He was buried on the third day. The God of heaven raised him from the dead. Now, knowing that information isn't enough, we've got to respond. How do we respond? Repent and believe. We turn from our sin. We turn from our rebellion against God. And we turn in faith to Jesus, believing in him as our Savior. But that's not where it ends. Because after we've become a child of God, after we've put our trust in Christ, after we are saved, we are to pursue God's design. That is a lifelong pursuit. And like I share with you, it was a child that, that I sat down with this week and his mom was there. And, and I like to ask the parent, because, you know, a child can, they can give you the right answers. Right? They, they, can, they can tell you the right things. But it's like you turn to the parent and you say, okay, you have a front row seat to your child's life. Do you think your child's ready? Do you think your child understands this? Do you see evidence of salvation in their life? Because church, if we're saved, there ought to be evidence of salvation in our life. So you look at the example of Abraham and you look at Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. It says, Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Well, here God has told him to go out and look at the night sky. God has told him that his descendants are going to be numerous. He's going to have offspring as numerous. Elsewhere he talks about as numerous as, as the sand on the seashore. Now how much sand is on the seashore? I don't have a clue. God does. Abram believed the Lord. How do we know he believed the Lord? Well, the scripture tells us he believed the Lord, but it wasn't just that the scripture declared that he believed the Lord in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. It wasn't just that the scripture tells us he obeyed the Lord in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. Look at his actions. We'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, but when God told Abraham to do one of the most difficult things that a parent could be asked to do when God tells Abraham to take his only son Isaac and to sacrifice him to the Lord, what does Abraham do? He does it. Now, by the grace of God, God spared Isaac. But Abraham was obedient. It was a demonstration of, it was an evidence of the fact that he believed the Lord. You don't see Abraham rationalizing with God and saying, God, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You're telling me that this son of mine is the one through whom there's going to be this great nation. There's going to be all of these people. And I'm old and my wife is old. And now you're telling me to go sacrifice him. This makes no sense. So back to this idea of pursuing God's design. This method of sharing the gospel that I've learned called three circles. This idea of pursuing God's design is an everyday pursuit. And I'm not doing it perfectly and you're not doing it perfectly. And part of pursuing God's design is when we mess up and when we sin, we confess our sins to the God of heaven knowing that he is a faithful and just God and he will forgive us when we confess our sins. And we continue to gather as a church family and we continue to be a part of groups in our church and we continue to serve and we continue to financially invest in the mission and we continue to go in obedience as everyday followers of Jesus because that is part of pursuing God's design and living the way that God would have us to live our lives. Now notice the writer of Hebrews says more about Abraham's faith. Look at verse 9, Hebrews 11 verse 9. It says, by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. So we discover in Genesis that God's promise to Abraham extended to Isaac and to Jacob as well. Abraham looked forward to the fulfillment of the Lord's promises to him. Look at verse 10 here in Hebrews 11. It says, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Abraham was looking forward to a permanent homeland, a heavenly one. 
Now notice the writer of Hebrews turns his attention to Abraham's wife, Sarah. Look at verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, according to Genesis 11, verse 30, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Now, Sarai and Sarah are the same person. So, if your Bible, hopefully, is still open, Genesis chapter 17, beginning with verse 15. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And then if you jump to Genesis chapter 18, beginning with verse 10, it says, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah, so Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. So here you see Genesis 17, Genesis 18, God promised a son to Abraham and Sarah, and God kept his promise. Now, it doesn't appear to me that the Genesis narrative or the story as told in the book of Genesis about Sarah, it doesn't appear to me that it highlights faith on the part of Sarah. But notice the writer of Hebrews refers to her as an example of faith. By faith, look at Hebrews 11, verse 11. By faith, Sarah received, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. So, so Sarah is here cited as an example of faith. She considered him faithful who had promised. And then Hebrews 11 verse 12, Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So the Lord promised Abraham that he would have many descendants, and he did. Now, Abraham and Sarah are not perfect examples of faith. In fact, we just saw in Genesis 17, Abraham laughed at the prospect of having a child when he was 100 and his wife was 90. We saw in Genesis chapter 18 that Sarah laughed, right? And, and, and as you see other things about them in Genesis, you, you discover they are not perfect examples of faith. But they are examples of faith. They are examples of faith. Consider King David. 1 Kings chapter 15 verse 5 says this about King David. David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life. Now, there's not a period, there's a comma. So I'll start again at the beginning of 1 Kings 15, verse 5. It says, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, comma, except 
in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. The matter of Uriah the Hittite was no small thing. If you want to read about it, go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And yet, the character of David's life can be described positively. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. David wasn't perfect. When you read about David's sin with Bathsheba and you read about David's attempt to, to, to cover up what has happened by, by essentially arranging for the death of her husband Uriah, you, you look at that and you say, that is terrible. It's despicable. David wasn't perfect. But 1 Kings chapter 15 verse 5 says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The author does note his failing in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. But the character of David's life can be described positively. David wasn't perfect. Abraham and Sarah are not perfect. You and I, we're not perfect. I mean, I would hope that it could be said of all of us as believers that we are examples of faith. That there's people in your workplace who, who could look at you and say, you are an example of faith. There's people that you go to school with who could say that you are an example of faith. There's people in your neighborhood. There's people in your family who could point to you and, and could say, look, he's not perfect. She's not perfect, but he is, she is an example of faith. Question is, what characterizes us? Is my life, is your life characterized by faith? Is it characterized by obedience? We have our failings, but we must continue to live by faith. We must continue to obey. Now, I want you to notice something else we pick up here in Genesis chapter 18, and that is this. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12, it says, Therefore from one man, that's Abraham, and him as good as dead, he was a hundred, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham and Sarah were seemingly beyond the age of childbearing. When God told them what was going to happen, they both laughed. And in fact, in response to Sarah's laughter, the Lord asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is clearly no. Now, there may be some things that we think are impossible. Like you may think that whatever you're dealing with right now cannot be fixed. You may think that your spouse or your child or your friend is unreachable. You may think to yourself that there's no way this person would ever put their trust in Christ. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. I mean, he, he reached Saul of Tarsus. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. I mean, God caused Abraham and Sarah, who were advanced in age, to have a son, Isaac. God caused Mary, who had not been with a man, to conceive in her womb and to bring the Savior into the world. In fact, Luke chapter 1 Verse 26 says, for nothing shall be impossible with God. So here we see this example of faith, or rather these examples of faith, the faith of Abraham, the faith of Sarah, as they trust in the Lord's promise. Not perfect examples of faith, 
but examples of faith nonetheless. So church, are we, are we living our lives by faith? Like, can we say today, and not just say it, but actually act upon it, can we say, yes, nothing is too hard for my Lord. Nothing is too difficult for my God. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God can do what we think is an impossibility? That God can take the situation that you think is not able to be fixed. That God can reach the person that you think is not able to be reached. And do we believe that God can do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think? Are we people of faith? And are we living by faith? Let's be encouraged by the example of Abraham and Sarah today.